Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to CS10 Lecture 7. Woo! So today's topic is algorithmic complexity, um, but we're going to start with the technology in the news in which we talk about Yahoo. And Yahoo, they have a system in which they think they can pull data from lots of different places and make the world's smartest political predictor by taking Twitter feeds and trends on search queries. You know, when Michael Jackson passed away, there were like a million spikes about his name. So based on these kind of things, these kind of social cues, they think they can predict what the next, who the next winner of the Republican nominee is going to be in the president. So it's very interesting. What worries me a little bit is that just like um, they never release kind of who they think is going to win uh, um, a, a district until the, all the, the polls close, because they want to make sure people don't just see, oh, turn on TV, ah, there, that my candidate is going to win or going to lose by so much my vote doesn't even count anymore and don't come in. My worry is that if they make this very visible, that could actually act as a feedback loop and make the wrong person uh, win. So the wrong person is whoever you're not voting for, I guess is the point of that. So this is a, they could affect the results. So it's an interesting point. OK. So today we're talking about the idea of algorithmic complexity. We saw on last time that we were learning about algorithms and algorithms in general and how we, saw, we see algorithms in the world and how you specify algorithms and how you think about them and how important they are to this course and to software design. So here's a review of functional abstraction. Here is a function f. You've seen it before. It has inputs and it has outputs. The outputs are only a function of the inputs. You've seen that before. And you have possibly no outputs. By the way, this block is a command whose goal is to draw something or to move a sprite or to make a sound. It could be a command. That's OK, too. Um, there is a contract. Again, I'll do my godfather. There's a gun drag. There's a contract which describes what that function does. This is part of the abstraction. This is getting back to the first lecture we had. The first lecture on abstraction really brings back here as that this is functional abstraction at its finest. You have no idea how f does its work. All you know is with that x, there'll be some f of x at the bottom, and you have no idea, nor can you care, nor, nor can you care, nor should you care how it gets done, as long as it adheres to the spec, the contract of how it gets done. So for example, what's in a spec? Here's a function called double. It takes in a number n, outputs the double of that, right? It's n times 2. So here's a spec typically. We're going to have a name. We're going to have an input, which might have the input type. We talked about the types, words, sentences, numbers, integers, etc. OK, requirements of that input. Oh, it's a number, but it can only be between, between 3 and 5. That's valid. That's a valid range of requirement on that input. It has an output. You can say none to that. You might have side effects. You might have example calls. You've probably seen this before. That's a standard thing. Here's an example. Double. Input n, where n is a number, any number, you know, complex, any of that. Output is n plus n. And here's the fun part. Ready? Watch this. What's not in a spec? And I said this the first time. How it gets done. How is so critical that you cannot put in a spec. Okay? Only what it does, not how it does it. So for example, my double guy could be n times 2. It could be n plus n. It could be n plus 1 n times. It could be n plus 1. It goes past it and then subtracts something at the end. It's like it, you know, like a, like it overshoots and then has to go and then backs up and gets to, gets to 2n. All of that's valid as long as at the end of the day it puts out 2n. Isn't that cool? That's really cool. Why is that cool? This gives you great freedom. That's my, my bouncing clip art. I love, I love bouncing clip art. Because now you, as the code author, can do, can do anything. Anything. What does that mean? You can do it efficiently. You can do it inefficiently. You can do it hack job. You can make it work. You can add one a million times. You can add two and then subtract some. You can do it any way you want. I'm not allowed to tell you how to do it. That's a really powerful idea. You get a spec for you want to build a house. Unless you put how to build it in the spec, which you're usually not allowed to do, that person can build it themselves with their own hands. They can cut down trees themselves. They can subcontract it to 40, 40 different companies. They can take a house from next door and rip it up and put it there and say, there's your house. You're like, hey, that was, that was my house. That was my house. That's legal. All that's legal. You put a house on that block, you can do any of those things. Okay. 
So that's really important. You have such flexibility, and that's delightful. Why is that delightful? Because now there's this freedom. And I have to do the kind of freedom Uchi Gucci dance. You have this freedom to do anything. You can optimize for many, many different things. Um, so we're back. The reference text that you want to have on your shelf, very seldom do you have this case where there is just one reference example book that you have to have and everyone in the whole world has. And Algorithms is the one. This book um, has really taken over as the Algorithms book par excellence, done by some folks at MIT. They're outstanding. It's, I was the book that I, was, I learned on when I was at MIT, and this is in version three. When it's time for you to go in the, in the profession, buy this book, but make sure you get the most recent version. So it'll probably be some variant of this, but it's on version three now, I believe. So algorithmic analysis. So Luke talked a little bit about correctness. Um, let's, let's kind of make sure you really get it. We're agreed that there's a common definition. An algorithm is correct if and I usually don't read slides, but this is important. If for every input, it reports the correct output and doesn't run forever or cause an error. Okay? It is correct is if for every input, it gives the correct answer and never does the bad thing, where the bad thing is crash uh, or, or uh, run forever. Okay? So correct. It's easy. It's obvious. Okay, correct means works for all the inputs, doesn't do bad things. Okay? Um, so incorrect algorithms may, as you can see from that, kind of like thinking of the logic of that, may run forever, uh, may crash, and also may not return the correct answer. They, will, they could still be useful. Approximation algorithms, as Luke talked about last time, could be really useful. I'll approximate the height of that building. That approximation may crash one out of every 100 times, right? It may run into an infinite loop one out of every 100 times. And it may also be wrong. But it's still pretty good as a first guess, right? You know, Google, can you translate this to this? It might not get the translation right, but it's pretty close. It's pretty good. So even though it's not correct, it still could be useful, something that's pretty close. Okay? But from now on, from this point on, for this lecture, it's only correct algorithms we're talking about. Okay? No approximation, no pretty good, no looping, and no crashing. Okay? So correct algorithms from this point on. And this is an example of an algorithm for managing vitamin D uh, steroids. Whatever. Some, some, something, some kind of process of vitamin D, and it's complicated, and it's an algorithm that they use for managing vitamin D something. OK, so normally we're talking about efficiency. We're talking about why, how we measure a particular algorithm, how fast it goes. So when we're comparing two algorithms, speed and time is the logical thing to think about. So let's think about this. How about time? The most logical thing is what we call stopwatch time. Okay. So how do we measure the time of an algorithm? So let's see how we do that. Okay. Well. Normally, the kind of the first blush answer might be the raw user time. Okay, so time with the stopwatch. The problem is several fold. One is different computers may have different run times. So I, I now test on my really fast computer. You test your same algorithm on your slow computer. All of a sudden, my algorithm looks really great. They're the same algorithm because your computer was slower in, in affecting and infecting that result. Um, you may have. The same computer may have different runtimes for the same input, depending on what else is running, maybe. Okay? And you also need to implement the algorithm in, term, in order to run it. So you say, oh, I have a great algorithm for doing this complicated thing. And I say, oh, I have a better one. And now you and I both have to implement it to decide who's the fastest one in front of the same computer with the same setup. So we don't like that. We are going to cross that off and not consider user time. We're not going to consider stopwatch time ever. So this is really important. Remember, we cross the stopwatch off. We don't ever think about that. Even though it's the logical thing you'd think about, oh, just time it. You don't do that. You can't do that because of all those reasons we just said. So we're going to count the number of steps. We're going to actually go into it like a recipe. Oh, it says, you know, cut the thing and then braise it and then put it on that. All those steps we're going to count, and that's going to be how we count the number, rate two different algorithms, the number of steps. And the fewest is what we want. We want the fewest steps to do the job. That's the idea. Where the steps are like the smallest primitive thing, like add a number, subtract a number, store this thing in the list, get it from a list, a basic primitive operation. Okay? So from now on, when we say running time, we're going to say, what's the running time of this algorithm? We're not meaning time. We cross the stopwatch off, and it means the number of steps. So we all computer scientists say running time. But that's not what we mean when we, that's not how you should think of it. You say, oh, he means, she means number of steps, not time. Okay? Because we're measuring time by steps. So here's the 
definite, the pure definition, and here's a little bit of a flavor uh, for those who are watching um, of our, our, our intro series of computing courses. CS10 flows into our 621 A, B, and C series. So the definition of thinking about running time is it's a running time as a function of what? As a function of the input size. And there may be multiple inputs, but for this simple case, we'll say there's just one input. And that usually might be the list, the length of the list, or some number n. We'll call that n. That is the size of the input. That's the number of things you're going to compute on. Okay? So if I'm going to sort some students, as an example, I'm going to sort some students by height. I'm going to get them up and make them rearrange themselves so it's like you know, tallest to smallest. Okay? Well, it's the number of students that I'm going to be sorting on is my n. Okay? How many are you operating on? Okay? So, so running time is a function of input size. We're measuring efficiency. The important thing is, in this class, we really don't care ever that you write efficient code. I mentioned that before in the clicker question. Only in 61B will we care about that. So that's like two classes from now. So if you stay with us, stay with the family of computing at Berkeley, you'll only worry about this in two classes from now. But it's important that you know, be able to look from afar and say, you know, that algorithm, that's this level of running time. And that one, that's this level. So you need to be able to look at things and kind of point at them and label them, but not worry about writing them yourself. Does that make sense? We'll never ask you, rewrite this more efficiently. Never. Okay? So that's cool. So now, one question you might say is, you know, for all these different inputs, it might be that, like, at the n equals 1 case, it's fine. n equals 2, it's, you know, medium. At this n equals 3, it's like this really weird case that it gets weird. And the 4 is fine. And you might have these, like, if you run into all the possible inputs, all the possible rearrangements of, say, four people. Let's think of that, right? I'm going to rearrange these four people and sort them in some order. It might be that if they happen to start completely out of order, like tallest to smallest, and I want to have it the other way, that that's the worst thing. And my algorithm totally takes a long time. But on average, it's pretty good. If it's mostly kind of shuffled, it'd be pretty good. But if you happen to give me, like shuffling a deck of cards, if you happen to give me a deck of cards exactly sorted the wrong way, my sorting algorithm might be terrible. And you ask yourself, well, that's a lot of different ways. Even for 52 cards, there's a lot of different ways the inputs can come to you. Do you look at, well, the average case, let's average over all those things, or the worst case? And this picture, this icon, this, this book cover kind of shows that we're going to consider the worst case. And there's three reasons we consider the worst case. One, it's nice to know what's the worst time I'd ever spend, right? Wait, I'm going to have write your card shuffling routine. How long will you ever take in the worst case? That's a useful question to have. And so that's why we'll consider it for that reason. Two, the worst case actually happens more often than you'd think. So it's not like this. Usually this, it's not like most of the time it's good and the worst case is like one out of every whatever. No, worst case actually happens pretty often. And the last one is, you know, what often we find is the average case is close to the worst case. So it kind of gives you that. And it's hard, a little bit hard, harder math to figure out all the cases and divide by all the possible cases. So thinking of the worst case is a little bit easier thinking about a problem. What's the, what's the worst thing my opponent could give to me in terms of input for my algorithm? That's what the running time is. Okay? So the final abstract, we're gonna, what we're going to do, by the way, this is a really fun class, because what we're going to do now after, after we get through all the slides is go through a lot of examples as we teach you these things, and you'll, and you'll be able to talk to each other, and we'll really talk about all the possible cases. So this is a lot of blah, blah, blah until I get to the actual meat of let's look at an algorithm, let's look at a problem, okay? So let me get you set up. We're going to divide the whole world of running times of programs into only six. That's pretty cool. So all I'll ever do is ask you, here's a problem, which one of these six is it? That's pretty cool. That's not that bad. And if you come out of this class understanding that, you know, at looking at an average thing and getting it right like most of the time, then I will consider myself a success having taught this to you. So that's the level of understanding we're expecting, just to make sure we understand, we're clear on that. So the four, by the way, these are called the order of growth. And if you ever have a sum of many things, you know, this particular algorithm is kind of like a, well, the number of steps it will take in the worst case is 2 times n plus n squared, you know, for a function of n, where n is the size of the input, number of cards you'll be shuffling. 2 times n times n squared. We're going to consider the dominant term. As n gets bigger, which of those two things gets bigger faster, 2 times n or n squared? n squared, right? That's a bigger thing. That's going to grow faster than 2n. Even though 2n might start faster than n squared, which it actually does, turns out that n squared is going to, in the long run, with big N, n squared is going to be the bigger dominant term. How about, oh, how about 1,000n over n versus n squared, which is bigger? Still n squared for big N. How about a billion, million, gazillion n 
plus n squared. Still n squared. The constants we're going to find out don't matter. So whenever you see a constant, make it 1, just in general, just to kind of give you some examples of that, OK? So dominant terms. So if I have a particular expression which has like a cubic term, which is like an n to the third plus an n to the squared term plus n, and maybe some constants in front of them, it's the biggest exponent that's going to win. The end of the third, the cubic term is going to be the dominant term. Okay? So for example, here's an example, 10 n squared plus 4 log n plus n, the n squared term wins. And it's quadratic. So take a look at those four, those six graphs. I've shown you six graphs of those curves, but in an interesting plot, on a log log plot. And that log log plot, which is done in, I think, uh, the Max Grapher software that I did, shows you what those curves are. Because you know, if you don't view it in a log log plot, all the Cubic, quadratic, exponential, they look like they grow really fast and you can't tell the dif difference. But look how different they are in here. Constant is a flat line. Logarithmic on a log log plot still looks logarithmic. Linear looks straight. Okay, that's the third one. As you're kind of going from the guy to the most to the right and sweeping this way. Then there's quadratic, which is a straight line on a log log plot. Then there's cubic, which is a straight line but a little steeper. Then there's ah, exponential. An exponential on a log log plot still grows exponential. So that thing is going to dominate anything. Even though, it look, it look, if you look at it, it actually loses to quadratic and cubic early on. At big N, it's easily the biggest one. It's the most dominant term. So exponential is kind of a, a special case. Okay? So those are the six guys cubic, a uh, constant logarithmic, linear, quadratic, cubic, and exponential. And that's it. Okay? So now, how about we go through many cases where we actually show you, and one of the, for every one of these examples, it'll be one of these guys. You want to try that? Say sure, sure. All right. So this is the time where we go through a lot of examples, and you pick these. So let's try it. Here we go. Your job is to find students by ID, meaning you're like Sproul, right? And there's an unsorted list of students that are at Cal, that are, out, that are your students. And someone walks up and says, hey, this particular student, we want to nominate them for a presidential medal. Are they a student at Cal? And you have to now look at your unsorted list of students, which is like a lot of papers on the floor, and find out if that particular student is at Cal, is it on that list. Does that make sense? OK. So what's the worst case number of, of if you have n people, what's the worst case number of pieces of paper you need to look at to find out if they're on your, in, in Cal? N, right? N is the worst case number of things you have to look at. Okay, so and the output, by the way, is yes or no, right? True or false. Okay, so the pseudo algorithm is go through one by one, checking for a match. If match true, otherwise, if exhausted, means you've gone through all of them. Then, then you and you didn't find the student, you say false. Okay, that pseudo code makes sense. That's what we got. Okay, how much work is done for every single one? When you're saying, okay, I pull up a piece of paper and I say, are you this student, right? Are you Jane Doe? Well, how much work? Is the amount of work you're doing for that thing also a function of the number of n? Or is it just like, look at it and you're done? Look at it and you're done, right? So you do one unit of look. The look, and then that's it, OK? So you do one thing for all of n possible cases. The worst case is you do exactly n, like we said. n means linear, OK? So constant would mean However big n is, you can answer it like this, like that. Okay? For example, I give you a list of L students, and up comes a student, and, it's, and the person asks you, am I living? Constant. I don't have to look at any of my n million students in Cal to say, yes, you're living. Well done. Congratulations for being a living being. Right? <laughs> That's not a function of n. But this one is. right? As n gets bigger, what I'm saying is, as n gets bigger, if it were constant, your time wouldn't change. But certainly it does change. You have more pieces of paper to look at. So it's obviously linear. Okay? Those of you who said constant, were you okay with that? Okay? All right. So hide that one and let's keep on going. Yeah? We're having fun? I like this is so much fun. Okay. And next problem. Notice that same kind of idea, but blink, something starts. Now my list of students is not unsorted. But sorted. And that means S-O-R-T-E-D, not S-O-R-D-I-D. -D. So it's a very <laughs> sorted list of students. And now, here's my pseudocode algorithm. Let's look at this. I'll even give you the algorithm. And then you tell me how much time it's going to take. Start in the middle. OK, 
Here, I'm thinking of a number from 1 to 100. Uh, I'll tell you higher or lower if you tell me the guess. Give me a guess. 50. Lower. Give me a guess. Anybody? Anybody? Yeah. Uh, lower. Uh, yeah. Uh, lower. Go. Uh, lower. Yeah. Lower. One. Higher. I like that. Good. Well done. Go. Uh, lower. Uh, lower. I heard five. Two. Uh, higher. <laughs> huh? <Three>. Higher. <laughs> Four. You got it. Okay. How many guesses did it take? Like ten. How many guesses should it have taken you? Ooh. Now let's see. You get to say any number you want. I say it one to a hundred, and you get to get you do the guesses. But I'm saying, I'm gonna pick. By the way, you know I was cheating. You know that I was cheating. I was changing the number I was guessing to make sure the gap was the biggest gap. So if you would have said, if the first guess would have been like 99, I would have said lower, not higher, right? I was gonna pick the bigger gap to make give me the most leave room, right? I used to play Battleship like that without telling the person I played. They'd like move it and I'd hit and I'd actually move my thing. No, miss. <laughs> miss, I'm sorry, miss. And I'd keep moving and they'd like, never beat me like that. How come I never win? Well, because I'm, I'm evil. <laughs> We're going to see there's a version of Hangman that you're going to see in the next homework which is called Evil Hangman where you keep dodging the words as they're guessing Hangman on you. It's pretty cool. Isn't that cool? Okay, so let's go back. Tell me... How many guesses should it have taken you? 25. No, 25 is too, too many. Six, I'm hearing six. Six is too low, eight's too high. Seven. How did I, so meaning you should have, you should guarantee that you can guess it in seven guesses. If you, if you do the right thing with your guesses, I'll play my evil dodging number and you should guarantee to get it in seven. How do you do it? Cut it in half every time. 50, I say low. You say 25, I say low. You say, you pick 12 or 13. 12, I say high because 12 is smaller than 13. Then, so now it's 12 and 25. And you keep cutting it in half, keep cutting it in half. How many cuts in half until you get it? I don't know. How many? Seven. Why is that? Math people. Did you have it? Yeah. Which one? The log scale. The log scale. Tell me. Give me an answer. Go. The log of what? The log of 100 is 6 point something. Yeah, because 2 to the 7th is 128. Therefore, the log of 100 is like 6 point something. So the answer is you can guess it in 7 if you're always cutting it in half. Huh? What's the thing? Is that the thing? Is the cool thing? Play this game with your friends. Say like, oh, bam, I guarantee that I can... You know, and guess it. And then if they don't know the cut in half idea, you can actually win by, you know, if they don't cut in half perfectly. So now, how about this? Ready for this? Now, stay with me. Now, in a completely unrelated question, I now have students that are sorted. <laughs> See how it's connected? Okay, so um, I start in the middle. If it's the match, retort true. Otherwise, if, ex uh, if exhausted, throw away half of L and check again the middle of the remaining part of L. Right? So student comes in. And I want to say if this Jane Doe, well, it, D is here, so I would, I, if they're sorted, then I have to kind of go in the middle. And I pull the middle student, is that Doe? Because it might be there's a lot of Ds. It could be. It's not like evenly distributed. You don't know how the students are, right? It could be like everyone this year is named D. So it's not like, well, the Ds are uh, near, obviously near the beginning of the al alphabet, so they're going to be at the front. It could be a lot of Ds that year, right? So uh, long story short, cut in half every time. Okay, that's the algorithm. Give me, I gave you the same algorithm. I gave you for free. Here's a hint. Here's a quiz hint. On exams, if you're doing kind of a cut in half system where you're always cutting in half and throwing away the other guys, that's going to be a, log a logarithmic process. If you're always throwing away half, then you're walking through your data in a logarithmic way, and that's a very efficient way of lo walking through it. If you remember the picture, how, how slow logarithmic growth is, we like logarithmic growth. That's a great algorithm. So we're happy with that. When we have a, a logarithmic algorithm, we're like, yeah, logarithmic. Maybe not so excited. I get it excited. Okay. Ready? Here we go. Next one. Ready? Stay with me and blink. What if L, 
the list of students were given to you in advance, like a year ago, and you have infinite storage. Infinite storage. Could you do any better than logarithmic? I don't know. If it's in advance, then at the least you could do is sort it, and you have logarithmic as you had last time, right? So it, it could. So of all, remember the curves like constants the best, then logarithmic, then linear, then quadratic, cubic, exponential, right? So at the least you've got logarithmic because you just sort it and you do la you do you, know, you go back one slide, okay? Or as mathematicians say, you reduce it to a problem previously solved. That's how they say. It. Mathematicians always have this special way of reducing things to different things. So that you reduce it to a problem previously solved, and that's great. So here we go. Stay with me. That was logarithmic. So you already have logarithmic. Can you do better? Can you get to constant? Possible? How would you do constant? No, no, different answers. Like for what, you know, you have to be, you still have the same success. Where if you give me a student that's not in the thing, I have to say it false. Give me a student that is in the thing, you say yes. Think of a list. You guys have played with lists by now, right? They play with lists. Okay. What if your lists have an index, right? You have an index on the side, right? If I put in five names, uh, Ann, Bob, Charlie, like Ann is number one, Bob is number two, Charles number three, that would be a sorted list, right? Okay. And a logarithmic walk through that data would be go to the middle student, grab them, see if that's the student less or bigger, and then go halfway in the remaining section. That's the logarithmic search in my list. That's the previous problem. What if each student has an ID? Let's just say they have an ID number. So rather than having Ann, Bob, Charlie, there's an ID associated with it. You know, names and numbers, that, they can be switched back and forth. You can translate between names and numbers easily. Okay? It's called hashing. Don't worry. You can make a name a number. Okay? Let's just say that ID is easier and you have IDs. So I give some ID and I say, is this ID in the list? Think. So in before, here's the old world where I had the list like this, and I have one, two, and three. Now, let's say in the olden days, uh, the numbers were doing by ID. So this side, this is number, this is student number two, and this is student number five, and this is student number ten, and I keep doing this. And so you, and so, you know, like twenty-seven, and I keep going. Okay, stay with me. And I say, and just this, just a simple case. Uh, I'll make one more just to make it kind of easy. The five, and I say a hundred and one. So these are ID numbers. And you say, is student three in your class? I say, I don't know. I go to the middle. Is three less than 10 or bigger than 10? Is, or is it 10? Nope, it's smaller. So I'll go smaller, and then I'll check somewhere in here. Is three, so I guess halfway between is this one, is three bigger than five or smaller than five? Smaller, uh, two. Is it bigger than two or smaller than two? Bigger up, therefore it's not there. You see how that would start? That's the, that's the logarithmic search, okay? I'm here, then halfway, then halfway, then halfway, okay? What if I thought of it like this? Watch this. How about this? You have infinite storage, remember. This is going to blow your mind. Ready? Can, you, can anybody see it, by the way? Can anybody already guess what I'm going to write? Is there some love from anybody who thinks that I'm going to, I'm going to write? Just to make it fast and constant. Give me, yeah, what, what's your name? Ivan. Uh, Ivan? Yeah. Ivan, tell me what I'm going to write. Well, you're going to write all the indices, uh, one through whatever. One, two, three. Four. Or yes, or a bit. No. I have no student three. No, I also have no chalk. I'm writing with my fingernails. This is this is blood. Blood will come out soon. It's okay. No, this is literally the smallest. This is like, like, like a, we call this a chalk roach. I, I don't know whether. Okay. So here, no. And then five, yes. I, I literally have a chalkboard. This is ridiculous. Yes. Do you see it? Can you see how this is constant time access? Hey, do you have student three? Brink. Nope. Constant time access. I didn't have to kind of search it and query all the different guys. Here, student three, well, start at 10, smaller than 10, smaller than five, bigger than two. No, I don't have it. Here, do you have student three? <clears throat> Look up access three. No, instantaneous. 
Isn't that powerful and cool? Now, what's the problem? Do you see a problem with space here? What's the problem? However big the biggest number is, I have to make my list that big so that I at least get that, right? So whatever the maximum student ID is, all nines, like 10 nines, what does 10 nines mean? Isn't that like array locations, you see? Whereas if I only had five students, the number could be, one of these numbers could be a 10 billion number, right? I could be a 10 billion number here, and it'd be OK. You see that? But in the world, in this world, if I had 10, if the maximum number of the ID is like 10 nines, then this has to be really long, and that could cost a lot. But what's the benefit? Constant time access. I'm going to channel this now. Now you're Google. You want to make your search queries instantaneous, less than a second, less than a tenth of a second if you can make it that way. What do you think they do? Do you think it's worth it spending a little bit more money on hard drives and 100,000 machines to parallel access that to give you fast query time? Or do you think they're pin pinching pennies and trying to pack it together to have a long query? Yeah, it'll take a long, but we'll save the bits. What do you think they do? The thing on the right. They go for the fastest access they possibly can because speed is critical for that algorithm. Yeah? Cool. OK, so finding a shared birthday. So, and people in the room, all of you in the room. I wonder if anybody shares a birthday. Isn't that? No, go ahead. I heard it has to be at least two There can be two people in the room who can share a birthday. Well, no, like, My twin brother. Like. <laughs> I don't mean to mock, but I mean. No, no, no. So, so what you're asking is, at what point does the probability of a shared birthday given randomly distributed birthdays exceed 50%? And I believe the number is 23. That's the puzzle. You can look at Wikipedia. It might be 24. But that's the idea. Like, at what point is the probability more than half that actually somebody shares a birthday? And once you cross 23, you get this. It's this kind of cool series that you can do. Um, fun little math thing. Um, here's how I think about it, just to give you a thing. You have n people in the room. And you have to check them for each person is one person. I have to check your date against all the other n. Oh, nobody matched. Remember, the worst, this is the worst case, right? In the best case, it's the next person. Right? Best case, it's I try one thing. Oh, hey, you're twins. And you know, go handshake and go, go to Tada. You can get like free birthday dinners if you go to the right restaurants. There's a place in Daly City to get Tada, and they feed you like this free birthday dinner. OK, so go do that on your birthday. OK, so I always buy the paper, so I know who's, what celebrities have my table. OK, um, no time. So that's the best case. What's the worst case? No, I check you against everybody. Sorry, no match. You go away. Next person, I check you against everybody else. Ah, no match. Go away. I keep doing this. So for every person, n, I'm checking with roughly n other people. Really, I mean, it's like n minus 1, but it's, it actually works out to be the same. Okay? So for every n, for every person, I have to compare them with n other things. Therefore, for every n, I have to do n work. For every n, I do n work, n times n, little square, n squared. Get it? So quadratic is that answer. So well done, 50% of you. Remember that one, OK? That's a hard problem, by the way. OK, the hardest one. Ready for the hardest one? With no time left. Ready? Go. Finding subsets. See if this is fast. Unsorted list of people, of set, like, this, like people there on that picture. The output is all the subsets, meaning if you wanted to have all the ways that those people could get together and like have a coffee, how many are there? So nobody could go get a coffee, so there's one with nobody in it. If just one person got a coffee, that's like, let's say three people in this case. That'd be A or B or C, so it's three different cases where just one person is there. Or if two people got a coffee, it could be A and B go, or A and C go, or B and C go. There's three more. Or if, if Three people went to get a coffee, and only three people, it'd be all three. There's only one way they can get all three. You get that? OK. So quickie, quickie one here. Fastest vote ever. What is that one? I give you no background of how to solve this. Worst case of how to do all the subsets given n people. I'll give you a hint. Three people yielded eight subsets. One plus three plus three plus one is 8. In fact, that is a row of Pascal's triangle, if you're mathematically inclined. 
And so what's the sum of a row of Pascal's triangle? Okay. Stop. Display. Exponential. Good job, guys. That's a hard problem, and it is exponential. Okay? It's always exponential, never not. In summary, we're talking about efficiency. Those six metrics were efficiency, and we'll only talk about those six pretty cool stuff. Thanks, everybody. We had a great lecture.